Welcome to Wild Olive Studies, a Messianic Gentile study of the Hebrew Scriptures. I'll be your teacher. My name is Dave Nitchi, but you can call me Dave. Today we'll examine who is Rabbi Shaul. I'd like to begin our session by asking you a question. How did the Apostle Paul dress? Was it like this? Or was it like this? So which is it? Was it like this very, very distinguished looking gentleman? Or was it like this very distinguished looking gentleman? I think the answer is obvious. If you've read your Bible and if you've been paying attention, Paul would have probably dressed not exactly like this, but pretty close to this and he would have read out of a Torah scroll. He wouldn't have had a book or a Bible to read out. Again, this picture shows a book, but there weren't any books during that time. So, today I'd like to explore the idea of what's in a name. We're gonna talk about the Apostle Paul's names. So for as long as I can remember, I've heard that Jesus or Yeshua changed the Apostle Paul's name somewhere along the Damascus Road. Now, I was taught that God changed other godly people's names, like Abraham was changed from Abram to Abraham, Sarai to Sarah, even Jacob to Israel. Well, I never questioned that. I mean, that's true, it's in the Bible, I read it. And again, I accepted it as truth. I never took it as a, an, an, another, I never had another thought about it. But I'm learning that that kind of blind obedience or blind acceptance has led to a lot of blo uh, wrong thinking and bad theology, by the way. As a result, I've learned that historically, some real twisting of the scriptures was done to fit what I thought was sound foundations. But I was wrong. I hope you join me as we journey and we examine the Apostle Paul in the light of history, the scriptures, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and some ancient Hebrew commentaries. I think you'll find that Paul, like his writings, have been misapplied and misinterpreted. And they were there, they've been done, that, that's happened as a result of trying to fit a anti-Semitic Gentile mindset. But don't take my word for it. Stay right there and let's see what saith the scripture as we discover who is Rabbi Shaul? We will be using Stern's translation of the complete Jewish Bible. So what I read will maybe a little bit different than what you've read in your NIV, your ESV, your ASV, or your King James. When we first meet him, he is introduced to us as Saul pronounced in the Hebrew Shaul in our English Bibles. First place we see this is in Acts 7.58. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to Acts 7.58, you wanna keep that handy because we're gonna be using a lot of scripture today. And so again, this is a Bible study. You'll need your sword with you. So in Acts 7.58, we read here, those who are stoning Stephen have thrown their garments down at his feet. And the witnesses, verse 58, and the witnesses laid down their coats at the feet of a young man named Shaul. It says that he's a young man, and it uses the name Saul. And that's all, that's all it tells us. That's the introduction to it. Nothing about who he is, where he comes from, nothing like that. The stoning of Stephen may have occurred just a few years after the crucifixion and the ascension of the Lord. And that would put Saul and our Lord close in age, probably there is no birth date given for Paul, um, but we know that he was martyred around 67 Christian era. And we first see the, the name of Paul then used a little later on in Acts 13. So if you'll turn in your Bibles now to Acts 13, we'll go to verse 9. Acts 13, verse 9. Then Shaul, also known as Paul, filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, stared straight at him. Who is Rabbi Shaul? Why did he have two names? 
And where does it say that God changed his name? The common accepted place that God changed his name was at his conversion. And that's in Acts 9. So if you will, turn in your Bibles to Acts 9. Let's go there and see if Yeshua changes his name. We're going to read verses 1 through uh, 8. Acts 9, 1 through, eight, uh, 1 through 8. Meanwhile, Shaul, still breathing murderous threats against the Lord's Talmudin, that is, disciples, went to the Kohen Haggadah, the high priest, and asked him for letters to the synagogues in, in Damascus, or in Damascus, authorizing him to arrest any people he might find, whether men or women, who belonged to the way, and bring them back to Jerusalem. To Jerusalem. He was on the road and nearing Damascus, or Damascus when suddenly a light from heaven flashed all around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Shaul, Shaul, why do you keep persecuting me? Sir, who are you? He asked, I am Yeshua, and you are persecuting me. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you have to do. The men traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. They helped Shaul get up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So leading him by the hand, they brought him into Damasek, or Damascus. Notice from the very beginning, it's Shaul, and notice at the end, it's Shaul. So does it say his name changed? I didn't find it, did you? Let's go back to Acts 13. Then Shaul, also known as Paul, filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, stared straight at him. Here is the first place we see the two names used together. Again, notice that it says Saul, whose name was changed to Paul. This would be a great place to explain such a significant event in Paul's life, but it doesn't. I mean, after all, in the scriptures, that's the precedent. When a name is changed, the Bible tells us. How can we just take it matter-of-factly and say, oh, well, God changed his name. I mean, aren't we kind of making the scriptures up to go to fit our theology? I think that's subject to a little bit of scrutiny here, and I think that's what we're doing here today. It's, again, Shaul before and Shaul afterwards. In fact, both names are used interchangeably throughout the rest of Acts. So you'll see Paul and you'll see the name of Saul. As further proof, if God or Paul were trying to distance him from the Hebraic heritage by changing his name, he certainly would not have identified so strongly with it. And what I mean by that is Paul never abandons the name of Saul. In fact, he reinforces it by telling us in repeated a couple places about his Hebrew heritage. What we do know of him is found in Philippians 3. Uh, 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 one of the places we know about him is in Philippians 3. So in your Bibles, if you'll turn to Philippians 3, we're going to look at verses 4 through 6. So if you'll turn there. If anyone else thinks he has grounds for putting confidence in human qualifications, I have better grounds. Brit Malah, or circumcised on the eighth day by birth, belonging to the people of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew speaker with Hebrew-speaking parents in regard to the Torah, a Perush, a Pharisee, in regard to zeal, a persecutor of the Messianic community, in regard to the righteousness demanded by legalism, blameless. That's Philippians 4 through 6. 3, 4 through 6. So let's drill down a bit and see what we can learn from Shaul. First of all, Shaul was a Jew. He was a Hebrew of Hebrews, okay? He maintains that here in the book of Philippians. First of all, this is obvious from this above passage. I don't believe Christians read him and think he's a Jew. Teaching about a Jewish Messiah from a Jewish Bible to other Jews and Gentiles. I think most of us Gentiles don't have a clue about Judaism and what we have been taught is subject to correction. In other words, there's a lot of bad teaching out there about Judaism and about legalism. And I think it's time we start taking a look at that. By referring to himself as a Hebrew of Hebrews, as seen in Stern's translation, a Hebrew speaker with Hebrew speaking parents, again, the term Hebrew of Hebrews, he could be saying several things. 
Some scholars say he was pointing to his bloodline, meaning both parents were Jewish with traceable lineage. Some say he was identifying with those Jews who were outwardly zealous for the Torah. Notice that he begins to close his list of five attributes with his expression of Hebrew of Hebrews. Let's look at those. These are those five things. Brimalah or circumcised the eighth day. Number two, by birth belonging to the people of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin and a Hebrew speaker with Hebrew speaking parents. In other words, a Hebrew of Hebrews. By listing his attributes in this order, J.B. Lightfoot notes that this list is in ascending order, or that Hebrew of Hebrews is last, functioning as an emphatic conclusion to the list as a whole. Consider each component and how it connects to the one before. I mean, he was circumcised the eighth day, showing that his parents were obedient to the Torah commandment. They were Torah observant. But because this doesn't rule out the possibility that he may have converted to Judaism, Shaul adds, of the nation of Israel, clarifying that his lineage is from the native-born parents, not proselytes. But being from Israel, where they, uh, uh, they were from a tribe that went into the, um, I'm sorry, but being from Israel, were they from a tribe that went into the diaspora because of idolatry? No. He clears this up by telling us of the tribe of Benjamin. So even with such an honorable tribal lineage, Shaul counters any claim of Hellenistic influences with Greco-Roman customs and language by ending the argument with the term Hebrew of Hebrews, thus telling his readers that he comes from a family that maintained his Hebrew culture and language in one in which he was not succumbed to Hellenistic influences of the day. So we learn firstly that despite what some authors have said and the way we might read Shaul, living in obedience to the Torah was and will remain of utmost importance throughout his life. Secondly, Paul's life will reflect what he says about the Torah, namely that it is holy, the commandments are holy, and they are just and they are good. Paul aspires to live according to the Torah. It doesn't mean that he believed he had to keep the Torah to be saved. It meant that he had faith in Yeshua, and so therefore, as a disciple of Yeshua, as a servant of Yeshua, he was to keep the commandments to become like Yeshua, because Yeshua kept the commandments. This is so important, and Christians get this wrong all the time. Why do you suppose that Shaul thought it was important enough for us, his readers, to know these facts about his life? In the letter to the Philippians, Shaul is clearly teaching that right standing before God cannot be gained by appealing to one's lineage and ethnic status. By making this point, he is clearly making the point that his lineage and ethnos were of no help in obtaining forgiveness of sins. Shaul is countering the claim by some that right standing before God could be achieved only by being a native-born Israel or a Gentile convert. Shaul then is making the point that right standing before God can only be achieved through God. Imputed righteousness of Yeshua gained through faith and not by ethnic status or obedience. Shaul's point is who better to make this argument than one who has impeccable orthodoxy? What about his other name, Paul? Was this an indication of his conversion to Christianity? Why then would God change his name to a Greek or a Roman name? That doesn't make any sense. If you're going to change his name, change it to something that's, that has some sort of a Jewish connection to it. Why choose a Greek name? That doesn't make any sense. God never did that. For the answer to these and many other questions, we need to study a little history and some interesting facts from the mouth of Paul himself. First, we see at the account of his arrest that he was born a citizen of Rome. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles to Acts 22, we're going to read verses 25 through 29. Acts 22, 25 through 29. But as they were stretching him out with the thongs to be flogged, Shaul said to the captain standing by, Is it legal for you to whip a man who is a Roman citizen? and hasn't even had a trial? When the captain heard that, he went and reported it to the commander. 
Do you realize what you're doing? The man is a Roman citizen. The commander came and said to Shaul, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, he said. The commander replied, I bought citizenship for a sizable sum of money. In other words, implying that did Paul do that? Did he buy his citizenship? And Paul emphatically replies, But I was born to it, Shaul said. At once, the men who had been about to interrogate him drew back from him, and the commander was afraid to, because he realized that he had put this man, who was a Roman citizen, into chains. That's Acts 22, 25 through 29. So did you hear that? He was born a Hebrew, as we've already stated, a Hebrew of Hebrews. He was born a Hebrew to Jewish parents who weren't proselytes, who didn't convert to Judaism, who were citizens of Rome, and therefore he was also born a Roman citizen. He was born in a Roman province. We'll talk about that later. We know that citizenship to Rome could be granted by an edict of the emperor without special counsel from the Roman Senate, and that it was not uncommon for Jews to have dual citizenship. So Paul, Saul, was a citizen of Tarsus, Rome, and Jerusalem. This was sometimes necessary to carry out business or official matters of state in occupied territories. One, however, could not buy citizenship. What Lysias, the commander overseeing Paul's case, claims as buying is really giving a bribe of a certain mediaries of a certain sum of money within the imperial secretariat of the provisional administration that added his name to a list of potential candidates for Roman citizenship. When citizenship was granted this way, it was common to take the emperor's name as your first name and retain your own name as your surname. Thus Claudius Lysias, who boasted of purchasing his citizenship, most likely received his status at the hand of the emperor, Claudius. Since we never see Paul with anything else but a single name, and since there never was an emperor by that name, we must assume that both his names, Shaul and Paulos, were both given to him at birth. Some scholars suggest that this sounds logical as both names sound very similar to one another. The name Shaul would have been received upon the day of his circumcision, attesting to his Hebrew heritage and likely namesake Israel's first king. Shaul, or better known as Saul. Both Paul and King Saul were from the tribe of Benjamin. The name Paul or Paulos would have been necessary to hold Roman citizenship and would have been required on his professio, which is like a modern day passport of today. This is an example of a professio. It, this is a golden tablet that's been etched with the information that's needed to identify the individual who's carrying this. These were usually small wooden boards for those who couldn't afford the gold, hinged together to, to hold birth information and, and identification. So why did Paul use his Roman name more than his Jewish name? Well, mainly it had to do with the context. To the Jews, he was Jewish. He was Torah observant. He was blameless. To the Gentiles, he was an ambassador of the good news, an emissary of the mystery of the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Again, we read in 1 Corinthians 9, if you'll turn there, with me. We're going to read in verses 15 through 23. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 15 through 23. If you'll turn there with me. But I have not made use of any of these rights, for I am the rights that he would have had as a Roman citizen. For I am writing now to secure them for myself, for I would rather die than be deprived of, of my ground for boasting. For I cannot boast merely because I proclaim the good news. This I do from inner compulsion. Woe is me if I don't proclaim the good news. For if I do this willingly, I have, I have a reward. But if I do it unwillingly, I still do it, simply because I've been entrusted with a job. So then, what is my reward? Just this, that in proclaiming the good news, I can make it available free of charge without making use of the rights to which it entitles me. For although I am a free man, not bound to do anyone's bidding, I have made myself a slave to all in order to win as many people as possible. That is, with Jews, what I did was put myself in the position of a Jew. I was known as Saul, 
in order to win the Jews. With people in subjection to a legalistic perversion of the Torah, the Judaizers, he would also have been known as Saul. I put myself in the position of someone under such legalism in order to win those under this legalism, even though I myself am not in subjection to legalistic perversion of the Torah. With those who live outside of the Torah, I put myself in position of someone outside the Torah in order to win those outside the Torah. Although I myself am not outside the framework of God's Torah, he makes that very clear, but within the framework of Torah as upheld by the Messiah. Again, under the framework of the Torah, under the Torah, not for salvation, but because of obedience. That was his standard of obedience. Again, to those Gentiles, he would have been known as Paul. With the weak, I became weak in order to win the weak. With all kinds of people, I've become all kinds of things, so that in all kinds of circumstances, I might save at least some of them. But I do it all because of the rewards promised by the good news, so that I may share in them along with the others who come to trust. That's 1 Corinthians 9, 15 through 23. And this was written about 54 to 55 CE, Christian era. So the usage of his birth name, Paul, was not as a result of his conversion to a new religion, but a way to identify with the Gentiles to whom he was called to share the gospel. When speaking in the synagogues to Jews, he continued to use Shaul in the same way. This explains the use of the terms grafting in into the tree of Israel. We, we read that in Romans 11. And the two, Jew and Gentile, becoming one new man, Ephesians 2.15, as demonstrated by his willingness to be born to Jewish parents and tutored under Gamaliel to be called by his Latin name. He was the embodiment of this one new man. He was born into two worlds, a citizen of both, true to the faith and observances of Judaism, while at the same time going to and calling the Gentiles into that faith, once and for all delivered to the saints. He truly was a type of one from two, the one new man. By using the name Paul, like Shaul, he shows us that while one's name might indicate status within the cultures of Rome or Israel, it provided no such basis for right standing with God. Therefore, he was teaching us that being Jewish or having a Jewish identity did not bring an elevated status with God. Instead, he was demonstrating that righteousness is an imputed status, like forgiveness, granted by God to the believer because of his, that is the believer's faith in Messiah and not by any legalistic works. We read this in Ephesians 3, 1 through 12. If you'll turn there with me, Ephesians 3. We're gonna read verses 1 through 12. It is consequence of this that I, Paul, am a prisoner of the Messiah Yeshua on behalf of you Gentiles. I assume that you have heard of the work of God in His grace has given to me to do for your benefit, and that it was by a revelation that His secret plan was made known to me. I have already written about it briefly, and if you read what I have written, you will grasp how I understand this secret plan concerning the Messiah. In past generations it was not made known to mankind as the Spirit is now revealing it to his emissaries and prophets, that in union with the Messiah and through God, uh, the good news of uh, the Gentiles were to be joint heirs, a joint body and joint shares with the Jews in what God has promised. I became a servant of this good news by God's gracious gift, which he gave me through the operation of his power. To me, the least important of all God's holy people was given this privilege of announcing to the Gentiles the good news of the Messiah's unfathomable riches and of letting everyone see how this secret plan is going to work out. This plan kept hidden for ages by God, the creator of everything, is for the rulers and authorities in heaven to learn through the existence of the Messianic community how many-sided God's wisdom is. This accords with God's age-old purpose accomplished in the Messiah Yeshua, our Lord. In union with Him, through His faithfulness, we have boldness and confidence when we approach God. And that is Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 12. 
We also read in Philippians 3, 8 and 9, we read this, Philippians 3, 8 and 9. Not only that, but I consider everything a disadvantage in comparison with the supreme value of knowing the Messiah Yeshua as my Lord. It was because of Him that I gave up everything and regarded as all garbage in order to gain the Messiah and to be found in union with Him. Not having any righteousness of my own based on legalism, but having that righteousness which comes through the Messiah's faithfulness from God based on trust. So he's not giving up his Jewish inheritance because again, we've already talked about how he played on that to show that he was credible. What he's saying was he doesn't count that as having anything to do with gaining righteous status or salvation or forgiveness of sins. That's what he means by this passage. So did God change Paul's name? Well, nowhere in scripture does it say so, nowhere. On the contrary, we can say it might have been an advantageous to use his Greek name instead of his Jewish name based on classical Greek verb uh, widely used at the time. Now, check this out. The Greek word saulos sounds like a form of Shaul or Saul and means, get it, conceited and refers to a haughty gait. It was used to describe the loose and wanton gait of prostitutes. It also has been suggested to mean haughty one, or one who is sexually attractive. I think based on this observation, Paul or Shaul made the right decision. So, to sum up today's study, God did not change Paul's name from Saul to Paul. Rather, they are his birth names, and using both his names invokes his dual citizenship. Because of his Jewish identity, Saul or Shaul maintained his Jewish culture and name when teaching to his Jewish audiences. When speaking with his Greco-Roman audience, he would rather use his diaspora name, Paul or Paulos, to relate to them within their culture. By retaining his Jewish identity and name, he demonstrated a level of authority and credibility to that claim. Yeshua was the Messiah and being Jewish by birth, that he was his legitimate um, Yeshua was the Messiah and being Jewish by birth that he was his, his legitimate apostle. On the road to Damascus, Paul asks, Lord, what will you have me to do? For Paul is a Jew, his faith in Yeshua gives a new level of meaning to his Jewish identity and changes his life meaning and purpose. Well, having said all that, we've taken a brief look at the apostle Paul's life. Continue with me as we continue to look at Rabbi Shaul's life. Please be with us next time as we explore further into who was Rabbi Shaul when we explore the man with the right education and the right calling. Shalom.